welcome to the Strange Brew podcast. My name's Jason Barnard and that was Quintessence and Notting Hill Gate. Very apt opening to today's show, which is tracks from the new Cherry Red box set, Deviation Street, High Times in Labrook Grove, 1967 to 75. And as always, I've got the compiler of that wonderful set, David Wells, here. A huge welcome again, David. Yeah, thanks very much, Jason. Thank you. As always, quite an interesting concept because the Ladbroke Grove scene, in a way, is the British or London alternative of Hay Ashbury. That's right, yeah. Um, we tend to think of everything these days as, say, the London underground, but it was slightly more specific than that. Based around Ladbroke Grove, Notting Hill, um, area of, of West London, really, that, that was why, uh, that was where most bands seemed to descend upon that area for reasons that we'll probably discuss throughout the show, actually. Um, so Quintessence were based in Blenheim Crescent, which I think uh, a lot of um, record collectors will know from Bill Allison and Bill Forsyth's shop in Blenheim Crescent over mm. the, throughout the 80s and the 90s and beyond. So it, it was um, a run-down area. Rents were correspondingly cheap, unless you were squatting, which a lot of bands did do as well. So it, it was somewhere that, that became like the home of the uh, British underground scene. And am I right that Quintessence, the band, weren't originally from Britain? It was some Australians and a was they American in the, in there as well. Yeah, there's a couple of Australians, Phil Jones and Ron Rothfield, uh, and an American guy. Uh, the bassist was Richard Vaughan, uh, and they all followed the same Indian guru. He gave them um, pseudonyms, alternative names, if you like, and they started playing at All Saints Hall, which is where. Most of the uh, the local bands um, sort of had their start almost after the the Pink Floyd had spent late '66 there under um, Peter Jenner, who was um, part of the London Free School. They were signed by Chris Blackwell at, uh, at Ireland um, after he went to the rehearsal. They they had a, they used to play in a basement of a Notting Hill fish and chip shop, <laughs> and um, he offered them a deal, and they uh, they recorded their debut album with. Uh, the producer John Barham who'd, who'd just been working on George Harrison's Wonderwall so uh, this came out uh, initially it was an album track in late 69 and they re-recorded it as a single and um, given the lyrics about getting it straight in Notting Hill Gate we couldn't really open with anything other than this I don't think and our next track also has a, a strong feel or, or strong link with uh, that Notting Hill Ladbroke Grove scene and Around the Deviants is a figure that, for many, is embodies the underground scene. That's uh, Mick Farron. That's right, yes. He was kind of like a proselytiser for the underground scene, if you like. He he was a jack-of-all-trades. He was a, obviously a very good writer, as he proved at the New Musical Express a few years later. Um, he was doorman, I think, at uh, UFO. In fact, probably the only thing he couldn't really do was sing, but that didn't stop him trying anyway. <laughs> As we'll hear on on Slum Lord again, which which has a Notting Hill base in that it's it's uh, inspired, if that's the right word, by uh, Peter Ackman, who was notorious Slum Landlord that area, who kind of ruled the ruled the scene, used to um, uh, let very badly run down premises out to people who was implicated in the um, Profumo scandal. He'd introduced all the main players, uh, Christine Keeler, Mandy Rice Davis. But the thing is, though, that he died in late 1962. So I reckon by the time that Mick Farron left Worthing and found himself in London, uh, it must have been just word of mouth, because, like I say, Rackman would have died before Farron came to uh, came to London. Uh, but it is just a two and a half minute sort of uh, rock and roll song anyway. It's not specifically about Rackman, I don't think, but uh, obviously the title Slumlord, it's clear what inspired it. And the label for the album that Slumlord features on, the album being Disposable, actually linked with a figure or a, a DJ that will reappear in, on the scene? That's right. All these people seem to be so interrelated. I mean, we'll discuss him probably in a few minutes when we get to uh, Trader Horn and Judy Diable. But uh, yeah, Simon Stable was like the front man for the Stable label, although it was actually owned by um, Lee Gopthal at uh, at Trojan B&C. But obviously, Simon Stable did the mobile DJ thing. He uh, he had a stall, I think, um, which he sold vinyl, et cetera, et cetera. So he was kind of like one of the movers and shakers. And uh, yeah, when when I was researching this this release, um, 
all these names cropped up time and again. It was like a little little scene. Um, in fact, I've got one reminisce. Somebody was saying that at one gig, Simon Stable popped up and, and uh, proclaimed Notting Hill, Lapid Grove, to be the centre of the universe, <laughs> which I guess it was if you were there. Levi jacket with an eagle on the back And that is one of the themes that will come in through here is that band members or managers, labels or people involved with labels will be threaded through this show and the box set more generally. That's right. There were two or three people who were kind of entrepreneurs, musical entrepreneurs, and they were based in the area, had Clearwater Productions. Peter Jenner and Andrew King had uh, Black Hill Enterprises in the area as well, so there were there were various people who were looking to break into the music industry, and um, as we'll find out, the next band Trees were actually put together in Doug Smith's um, of Clearwater Productions in in his flat. Really, a couple of them crashed there for some while. Um, Celia Humphries lived just around the corner with her boyfriend, future husband Peter Drummond, who was uh, Radio One at the time. And yeah, they uh, they were signed to CBS and uh, made a great debut album. And people probably don't associate Trees with Notting Hill, but they were a Notting Hill band. Their first full gig was at All Saints Hall? It does seem that almost every band's first gig was at All Saints <laughs> Hall. Um, it, it was something that um, Peter Jenner was encouraged to use because otherwise it would have been standing empty, derelict. In fact, we'll find that with a lot of these. The reason why a lot of these bands were there is because a lady called Bruno Laslett helped start up the London Free School, but she was always also employed by the uh, local council to Notting Hill uh, Housing Association, I think, and she was... Uh, there's a lot of derelict properties around there, empty properties, and so... The council asked her to, to fill them cheaply so that they, they weren't left to rot and squatters move in. And her son, uh, who was known to everybody as Mouse, was the roadie for the action and then Mighty Baby. And he also helped out at Pink Floyd's early um, lighting show at All Saints. And so naturally, people like Mighty Baby moved into the area. You know, uh, Ian Whiteman was saying that he had this uh, fantastic Victorian property that he was able to rent for five pounds a week. That was partly why there were so many bands in the area. It was so cheap because um, they were the obvious fillers of the uh, of the properties that were around because of Ronald Laslett's uh, son was, was part of that scene. 
Going back to trees from the album The Garden of Jane Delaunay here, we've got Nothing Special, which I think was also appeared as, as a single as well. It did. There's a heavily edited version, I think, that was issued as a single, but obviously we've used the album track. Yeah, I mean, they made two great albums. Didn't really sell that well at the time, and obviously it's only now or well, many years later, that, that people kind of value what the band was doing. If you can get your hands on a copy of uh, that album, you'll be uh, very well off. That's right, yes. I mean, I, I, the band was formed when David Costa was in Notting Hill Gate coffee shop and he bumped into Doug Smith, who was just about to start up Clearwater Productions. And so, yeah, they did play first gig All Saints Hall in August 69. And then they also played at the 1969 Notting Hill Fair, as it was called then, so yeah, they they were uh, definitely part of that scene, and uh, the the lead guitarist Barry Clark actually said, yeah, we, we used to rehearse in Doug's flat in Westmoreland Mews in Notting Hill Gate, and the band was really formed there. So again, they seem a little bit too middle class in retrospect to be part of that kind of um, fairly scuzzy scene, but but they were there.
And now an act we've alluded to earlier in the show. We've got Trader Horn and the song Velvet to Atone, which is from their, their fantastic album Morning Way. And this being a, a combination of uh, ex-Fairport singer Judy Dibel with Jackie McCauley, but I wasn't aware how strong the uh, the link to that Notting Hill scene is. That's right. Obviously, Judy Dibel had been in uh, Fairport Convention. She then moved into the Notting Hill area with a friend showing a flat and via that kind of uh, uh, sort of serendipity, she uh, she was introduced to various players on that scene as well. Um, she eventually formed uh, an association with Jackie McCauley from who'd been in Belfast Gypsies and before that them, uh, and they made as you say they made that great album together. The person who wrote the sleeve notes for that, Brian Patton, was actually her next door neighbour in Notting Hill. So again, very incestuous, but uh, she was, by that point, she was uh, living with um, Simon Stable, whom we mentioned earlier. They made that album, uh, and then Judy kind of got a bit of stage fright, I think, and the duo split up, uh, and I think Judy and her husband moved out from London a year or two later. But uh, yeah, they were definitely, again, part of that scene. There's a picture in the uh, in the booklet of Judy Dival's husband, Simon Stable, in their flat with uh, Joe F- Fitzgerald, who's he is featured tonight. So um, we'll discuss him later on. But yeah, it was like I said, everybody seems to know everybody else in a, you know, within a, a square mile or so, and they all kind of collaborated. We've next got Tyrannosaurus Rex, Rings of Fortune, from August 1967. This was the Tyrannosaurus Rex of Mark Boland and Steve Peregrine Took. Before Mickey Finn replaced uh, Steve Took in late 69, I think. Yeah, after he left John's Children, Boland put an advert in International Times. Steve Took answered the ad, and they, they put together a four-piece band that, that kind of fell apart after only one gig. Uh, but Boland and Took stayed together as kind of I think heavily influenced by what the Incredible String Band were doing that kind of mainly acoustic sort of hippie flower power folk duo uh, this song Rings of Fortune is taken from their first demo session which is August 67 
then they signed to Google's own phone. By that point, Bolan was uh, was living with uh, June Child in Blenheim Crescent. The, uh, June Child was the secretary at Black Hill Enterprises that we mentioned earlier. And Steve Took was hanging out with people like Twink and the Deviants. Give them a chicken out and laugh. It's your own fault. Okay? You do the voice. A bit of Jefferson Aeroplane. <laughs> We've got Skin Alley and Sun Music. And Skin Alley being a group often associated of just playing the festivals. Yeah, uh, one of the bands said that the only reason we play for free was that nobody would pay us. Um, but but because <laughs> that wasn't mentioned at the time when it became like um, a rite of passage almost for a band in that area to be playing for the community. Again, all these bands are linked. They were looked after by Clearwater Productions. They hawked their early uh, recordings around various labels before they signed a CBS. And again, they were produced by Dictator of the Pretty Things, their first album. That was included on Fill Your Head With Rock, but then they, they recorded a second album to Pagham and Beyond. And that's where the track that we're featuring, I think, Sun Music, came from. They'd initially recorded this for the Glastonbury Fair album, but this is a, a re-recorded studio version. One of the band crits off Henrik Juziek. He did a QA on, on The Strange Brew and he reflected on that period. And I guess this was well, about to summarise of what he said, summarises the scene more generally in that period, in, in that um, Notting Hill lab grow up scene. There was a positive feeling of the young generation that they could do anything or they were free to do stuff. And that's just not the case now. No, I, I think it is a case of you've got a, a small community. How well some of them got on with each other is a, is a, a matter of debate. Um, there, there are various quotes from people involved, even people like Mick Farron, who, who said that he was running with some dangerous people. They didn't necessarily all get on, but they were all kind of managed by the same two or three um, organisations, uh, like I say Clearwater especially. And in fact, Skin Alley lost Thomas Crimble, to another Clearwater Act, Hawkwind. So that they were kind of like um, mixed with these um, bands because they were all under the same agency and and it would be nothing for, for the agency to say, oh, we've got a gap here, you go over there, etc. Almost like a, a football transfer, something like that. 
So, uh, yeah, I think even with the album that we, we're talking about now, To Pagham and Beyond, the band said they had to leave Notting Hill to write the songs because it was just so... Um, so difficult to concentrate they would be playing gigs all the time and you know whatever um various other recreational activities should we say um and they just found they couldn't write when they were living in notting hill so they actually went to pagham which is in west sussex to write the album and yet weirdly after all that they kind of ended up on ardent the american label that had big star and big star's famous meeting the uh, the press gig sort of coming out ball um Skin Alley were on that as well. And it's really weird to think of this kind of free festival band from, from Notting Hill following a big star on stage in America and in Memphis. But that, that's the way it was. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was fundamentally a very localised thing. But, um, again, it had did have unexpected consequences too. Sun Music, the track, that's on Two Quid Deal. That's right, yeah, that was the follow-up to, uh, again, I mean, they did, I think, something like four albums in the space of a couple of years. Um, so it wasn't that they were uh, considered a tax loss or anything like that. They sold well enough to carry on making uh, making albums. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Sun Music was, was uh, recorded with Roy Thomas Baker, who went on to be uh, Queen's producer. So yeah, that by then they were signed to Transatlantic, but um, like I say, that that came out on Stax, who uh, uh, also had the Ardent label, and uh, they ended up in America for a few years or so.
We have the Aquarian Age, 10,000 words in a cardboard box, and the Aquarian Age being a, a spin off of tomorrow. That's right, yeah. We mentioned uh, Twink earlier in passing, I think, and uh, this was in 68, oh, just as tomorrow were collapsing. Steve Howe was doing things like uh, Bodast, Keith West was being groomed for a solo career, and uh, Twink and Junior from tomorrow made a uh, single 10,000 words in a cardboard box with Mark Wirtz. It was obviously with Tamara's producer as well. And I think Clem Catini is on drums. And allegedly, according to Twink anyway, the song's about Keith West and how they kind of fallen out with him. Uh, there's a lyric about there he goes on the, on a voyage of his own delusion. And I think they thought that, that the teenage opera thing had kind of gone to his head a little bit. But um, who knows? But uh, a great song anyway. And Twink re-recorded it a year later uh, for his Think Pink album which again is another sort of um, Labrick Grove, Notting Hill artifact, really.
and no podcast on the scene would be without Hawkwind and we've got the very start of Hawkwind here labelled Hawkwind Zoo Hurry on Sundown We've got a couple of Hawkwind tracks on on the uh, CD um, obviously they had to be represented but this is Hurry on Sundown this is the original version of a track that then appeared on their first album again produced by Pretty Things Dick Taylor or former Pretty Thing Dick Taylor at that point he'd left the band uh, and yeah, again, they turned up an All Saints Hall gig. Yeah, All Saints once again, uh, August 69. And Clearwater were showcasing a couple of bands, Skin Alley and High Tide, who were also on our compilation. And High Tide had just signed to a deal with Apple Publishing, so they had loads of brand new equipment. So Hawkwind turned up and asked to play. Can we use your equipment? It's, it's you know really nice and new. John Peel was there and he suggested to Doug Smith of, of Clearwater that Hawkwind were a decent band and, and he should sign them uh, and he did and then this was recorded at Abbey Road just before they actually um, started work on the first album by which time they dropped the Zoom just called Hawkwind
band had morphed by this period, the Pretty Things, Sickle, Clowns and Parachute. A number of band members who were involved in this had come out and gone, like Twink and Dick Taylor had, had left by now, even though he was involved in that scene. So you've got Wally Waller coming to the fore here, especially, and Phil May was, was still around, of course. Yeah, um, most of Parachute was written at uh, Phil May's um, Notting Hill flat uh, with, with Wally Waller. Yeah, Sickle Clowns is interesting. Uh, it's on the, on the album Parachute, which is fantastic, obviously. Uh, Sickle Clowns is interesting, though, because it's a Wally Waller lead vocal. And I think most people, if they heard the track, or was they about to anyway, um, would think it was Phil May singing. Mm. Just slightly more guttural, I think, than Phil May. But uh, great vocal anyway, and a great song. Dick Taylor had gone by then. Vic Unit was in the band who'd been in the Edgar Broughton's band and then went back to them afterwards. We have got Edgar Broughton on the compilation. I don't think we're featuring them tonight. On the uh, the very extensive notes that you've got with the box set, you, uh, <laughs> you get to uh, write an urban myth about Parachute. That's right. I always, I've always i seen this for so many years that it was Rolling Stone's album of the year. It wasn't even reviewed, let alone mentioned in the, uh, the end of year poll or whatever. Um, but it's been used over the years so many times to promote um, Pretty Things material, album of the year, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't, <laughs> which is not to say it shouldn't have been, but um, mm. it, it wasn't even reviewed. So, yeah, that, that's um, one of the uh, advantages about writing notes is that you can set the record straight. Whether anybody reads it or anybody cares, I, I, I don't know, but it's there for them if they do anyway. <laughs>
So now we have Steam Hammer turn around from their Steam Hammer Mark II LP from 1970. This was a case where the group originated around Worthing, but then relocated into the scene. Interestingly, um, like uh, Mick Farron, they were in Worthing before they decided to come to, to London. So, yeah, they, they had a squat in Oxford Gardens um, with a slightly drug-addled Davy Graham leading, uh, living below them. And so I've, I've recounted in the sleeve notes um, quite what sounds to be like a quite scary incident where David Graham decides he wants to be the uh, the singer in a blues rock band and he uh, basically comes at Kieran White, the, the actual lead singer of Steve Hammond, with a knife. Again, uh, David Graham at that point was, uh, was advertising um, himself as a guitar tutor. Again, they were kind of in, in local newsagents windows, etc. The adverts for to, to go and be taught guitar by oh, David Graham, which seems amazing. really bizarre these days. Obviously, you've got Graham Bond living around the corner as well, and um, so yeah, Steam Hammer must have thought this is the place to be. And they did go on to make a few albums, and obviously, they um, Junior's Wailing was basically taken by Status Quo, and uh, they made a tiny amount of money from, from that. But um, yeah, quite an interesting band, Steam Hammer. Uh, and this is one of their more um, introspective numbers, Turnaround. Yeah, I was going to say that. That Turnaround is not your standard blues rock fair. No, it isn't. Most of their stuff isn't. But somehow they built some kind of reputation around three or four songs which were the heavy bluesy stuff. But there's a lot of things like flute and kind of fairly ornate instrumentation as well. Uh, yeah, Lavinia is another one of theirs, which is a gorgeous ballad. Mm. But yeah, somehow they have got a reputation. It's funny how we pigeonhole things. And you go back to it and you think, well, hold on, this isn't what I was expecting at all. And, and Steam Hammer are a case in point, really. Ladies and gentlemen, the bull.
Next we've got GF Fitzgerald and April Affair. Gerald Fraser Fitzgerald, he'd been around the music scene in the, that more psychedelic era, originally opening up for the likes of Pink Floyd and Soft Machine. Yeah, he'd been in a band called Mouse Proof, and then when the band collapsed, that's what he called the album that he was making, Mouse Proof. So yeah, he was actually from Edinburgh initially, and come down, and he's running an electric, electrics business, and that was how um, he was eventually... He was eventually offered a deal by Chris Blackwell after after he'd kind of wired up the, the island record shops locally, <laughs> which is pretty weird. But again, Mouseproof features a lot of people around the area. He used to busk at Notting Hill Gate. He became friendly with Rick Kenton, bassist, who went on to Roxy Music, who we'll discuss later on. Um, and Mouseproof made their debut at, at David Bowie's Arts Lab in Beckenham. But the album Mouse, Mouseproof is, like I say, it's a, it's a very kind of uh, Notting Hill, Labrick Grove album. It's got people like um, Lemmy on it. It's got uh, one of the guys from Cochise. Cochise, is it? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Judy Diable's on there. The track we're, we're playing, April Affair, is about being based in Notting Hill Gate. There's a line, if you're passing through the gate, perhaps you'll see me there breathing down Portobello Road. John Peel played it a lot, and the... Uh, Underground publication Friends, which was based in Portobello Road, gave it a fantastic review. But again, it's a very experimental thing. I would say April Affair is probably the closest it comes to being commercial. It's a great song, though. Um, so, yeah, it's not, nice to give it a wider audience, really. Take your 
great track Skate Coming and I certainly wasn't familiar with this it's uh, Mattia Clifford and Changes and, and Mattia originated from Zimbabwe Yes I believe so I mean he, he became known as at this point he was just leading a band called Mattia he, he then became known as Mattia Clifford but there is two Christian names um, I think his surname is actually Chevalusa something like that anyway uh, he came to London in 67 I wanted to include the local black musicians, almost like the Windrush generation, because I always feel they've kind of been marginalised a little bit by the hippie underground. The band Mattia played at the People's Carnival, and he'd played in Power Square um, as what was billed at the time as various local musicians. He supported a Hawkwind at the Temple in late 1970, and he was signed to a label called Square, a square record was their, their slogan. <laughs> so yeah, he he, um, he did go on to record a single for them, although there seems to be some doubt about whether it actually came out, but he also did an album, and this is a track that's recorded in March 71 that was going to be on that album, and it's never, never appeared before. Uh, it's first ever physical release anyway, and it's a great song, and you can hear how sort of local black musicians and uh, we've, we've got one or two others on there as well including the band Noir had to get a, a more rock sound in order to try to appeal to um, to what was happening at the time to the agencies that were hanging around people like Clearwater uh, and they were featured in like I say the local underground publications but um, they didn't quite get the breaks as much as the uh, the white bands I would say so yeah, it was important to try to try to cover that scene and point out that a lot of those people who were living locally who have kind of been overlooked a little bit. And this is a perfect example of a great song that should be much better known, or it should be known at all. It's not known at all, really, but um, it, it should reach uh, reach an audience. So yeah, it's nice to include something of, of this caliber that's previously unreleased. <laughs>
and a group now who you wouldn't necessarily associate with uh, the Lab Book Grove scene, especially when you get to the 1980s. However, the middle of 1971, you've got the very early Roxy Music recording, a demo of 2HB, and this is squarely in that, that area and, and musical scene. It is. I think over the years, um, even at the time, to be honest, Roxy Music were kind of thought to be posh kids who were, had bypassed that idea of paying your dues and playing live and, um, you know, building up a reputation by traveling all over the country and playing gigs. So, yeah, I mean, um, it's a little bit facetious, including Roxy Music, but they were part of the Notting Hill scene. The guitarist, Phil Manzanera, when he came in, was saying that he uh, he had to attend this derelict house in Notting Hill where it was so cold and the band had so little money that they were pulling the bouncers to bits in order to make a fire to keep warm. So we don't really tend to associate Roxy Music with that kind of behaviour. Uh, obviously, Brian Ferry, I think, is quite well known that he'd come down from the north, come down from Newcastle. He was a miner's son, and he was living in a flat with his heiress girlfriend in Kensington High Street. But other people um, were were living in the Notting Hill area. Um, the track we've got is has got guitarist uh, Roger Bunn uh, featured. And he, again, was pretty much an Onning Hill scene star. Again, we're not playing his, his track tonight, but it is something from his solo album on our compilation. Yeah, this is uh, recorded on Eno's um, homemade, um, sort of home uh, tape recorder, recorded in uh, May 1971, which is a year or so before they got anything out. So, yeah, at that point, they were just um, a local band trying to find somewhere to play with very little money. Uh, they were lucky that EG, who took them on, were also based in the area. And again, were, were looking for bands out of the ordinary. I think um, I think Brian Ferry initially um, auditioned for another EG band, King Crimson, as did Elton John. But obviously that's, a, that's another story. But uh, So they were part of that scene. Even if they weren't actually playing gigs, they were rehearsing for months before they actually got anywhere. You've got a fantastic photo in the booklet of Brian Ferry in, in July 1971, <laughs> and that's very much pre-glam. Yeah, nobody had introduced him to a stylist at that point, obviously. Uh, as has been pointed out, he looks like um, somebody who played centre-forward for Wolverhampton Wanderers in the late 60s or something like that. He, he certainly doesn't look like he's about to become a style icon.
I think this time from early 1970 and it's the group Rosemary with if Dave Allen who was on vocals he was he from Portsmouth but he still had a strong connection the, with, with the yeah scene. the actual band themselves Rosemary were from Portsmouth but Dave Allen was um, their front man and um, the band had a roadie who'd moved into Labrick Grove become friendly with Steve Took so kind of they were in the area a lot especially Dave Allen he was dossing as he said in Notting Hill Gate 
in what he described as a, a house full of drug dealers and German prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> so they auditioned for Clearwater. Again, All Saints, of course. Um, but they recorded a couple of demos. Okay, this is very low-fi quality because it was kept on a tape recorder at the time, which has, you know, been passed down to a cassette. And then we've tried to enhance it a little bit in terms of the sound quality. But um, this is just too good not to uh, not to feature. I mean, it sounds such a hybrid of Buffalo Springfield and, and Arthur Lee's Love, but it's an original song. And um, yeah, it's really, really a thrill to um, to come across something this good at this late stage of the game because we're talking 52, 53 years ago and it's never come out before. So, um, yeah, let's hear it for Rosemary, I guess. Telling lies and don't concern yourself with balls or with the feelings that will fall. Because I think you're wasting time by claiming them as your domain. That old lies of love, the juicy staring from above, should seem to talk to you. And don't concern yourself with walls Or with the buildings that will fall Because I think you're wasting time By claiming them as yours or mine So we'll get to our penultimate track, and it's Shagrat, Still Yawning, Still Born. Again, this wasn't originally released at the time, but this time we come back to Steve Peregrine Took, formerly of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Again, Steve Took, I, I think it's fair to say that him and Mark Boland weren't singing from the same hymn sheet. Boland was very ambitious. Steve Peregrine Took just really wanted to have a good time, I think. So um, he disgraced himself in America <laughs> in the summer of 69 when Tyrannosaurus Rex toured there and basically Bowen and his entourage just abandoned him in, in Los Angeles. <laughs> so then he, he came back, he contributed to, to Mick Farron's solo album, and then he formed Shagrat with Larry Wallace and a bassist called Tim Taylor. Initially, Mark, uh, Mick Farron was also involved, but he'd kind of been squeezed out by the time they cut some demos at Strawberry Studios, obviously home with the Embryonic 10cc. 
Uh, and they played Fun City, which again is quite a notorious gathering of the tribes of the time. But um, Larry Wallace and the new drummer, uh, Dave Bidwell, who was also in um, Cobb, I think, Clive's own band, had other commitments elsewhere. So often Steve took basically played solo gigs. And at that point, he kind of took on, again, we, we mentioned Arthur Lee in terms of um, the Rosemary just now. And mm. some of the demos that, that Steve took made, um, he was on acoustic guitar and Larry Wallace was on acoustic bass and Dave Bidwell was on tambourine. Still Yawning, Still Born does sound to me like uh, like a homage to uh, to Arthur Lee, really. Steve Took wasn't all that together, shall we say, and uh, he did hang around the, the Grove for quite a few years, playing at the Long Hill Carnival, appearing on bills of Hawkwind, Pink Fairies, but he died in 1980 at his Westbourne Park home when he was only 31, sadly. But, I mean, in, in subsequent years, some of his early demos have come out, and they do show a kind of genuinely talented songwriter. And, uh, as I say, Still Yawning, Still Born isn't just... Um, uh, inspired by Arthur Lee, it's a good song in its own right. David and it's Motorhead Lost Johnny. This was a track that was recorded in 1975, the the early, very early period of Lemmy and Motorhead, as opposed to it, its eventual release later on in the 70s. That's right. Yes, I wanted to. Um, I mean, the scene really starts around the time of psychedelia, with um, about 1967 or so in Labrook Grove, Notting Hill. I wanted to go on to the mid seventies to show like bands like um uh Joe Strummer's early band, the one oh one ers. Uh I think we've got um Michael Moorcock as well, who was in the in the area and hang around with Hawkwind. And I wanted to include uh, an early motorhead track as well. Uh Lemmy was sacked by Hawkwind 
in Canada in May 75 for drug possession. I think he once joked that it wasn't so much that he, he was um, he had the wrong type of drug rather than it was a, a problem with the, of the drugs itself in terms of Hawkwind. So anyway, he, he uh, we just mentioned Larry Wallace being part of Shagrat. Uh, Lemmy got together with Larry Wallace and a drummer called Lucas Fox, who he knew from hanging out with him at Speakeasy. They initially tried to call themselves Bastard, but uh, the manager, Doug Smith, who, who uh, again was the main man at Clearwater, come up once again, uh, pointed out that they probably weren't going to get far with a name like that. <laughs> so they, they set up for Motel, which was the title of the last song that Lemmy had written for, for Hawkwind. They were signed by Andrew Lauder at uh, United Artists, and they went to Rockfield to record a, a debut album with Dave Edmonds as the producer. The drummer was basically a mate of, of um, Lemmy's rather than, you know, a real technocrat or anything like that. And he was replaced during sessions by uh, Phil Taylor, better known as Phil, Filthy Animal Taylor, of course, uh, who overdubbed the drums on, on every track except for this one, Lost Johnny, which is a, a remake of a track from the Hawkins album, Hall of the Mountain Grill, which is written by, this tra- particular track was written by Lemmy and Mick Farron. United Artists weren't weren't impressed with what they heard, and uh, the album didn't, didn't get released until right at the very end of the decade when um, when Mote had broken through when they'd been signed by Prawns. So uh, yeah, it came out four years after it was recorded, but it was actually cut in December 1975. So this seems to be an appropriate point at which we kind of leave that scene and um, just show not, not exactly a new generation, but a new wave of, of musicians almost that, that would be involved in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic range of talent from one small area and it is a, a fantastic legacy that it, it left. Yeah, I, when I was putting it together, I did feel like I sort of um, um, was on the set of With Nail and I. <laughs> uh, there is that kind of sleazy, run-down quality, but there's still quality, as I say. It, it is still, as you said, that there's, a, there's a lot that is very listenable, and it does make a surprisingly coherent compilation, I think. I, I wasn't sure when we first had the idea for this kind of thing how it would pan out, but um, in the end, I, I had nearly four CDs worth of stuff that I had to whittle down to three CDs. And there were things that were left out. Um, I do think it works really well. And it's kind of like the most complete sort of overview yet of that scene. Like I say, we've managed to include so many things that, um, you know, haven't really, like I say, there's the 101ers on there. We've also got uh, uh, Ginger Johnson and his African Messengers, who used to play locally. They uh, played at all the Notting Hill carnivals. They backed uh, the Rolling Stones when they uh, played Sympathy for the Devil at Hyde Park. So it's really nice to, to be able to put all those people under one roof and say, well, this is the scene. The only people we couldn't really get were, were Pink Floyd, who were on the kind of outskirts of that scene. But we got everything else that we wanted. Fantastic. Well, this is just a taster of what is another fantastic set. Deviation Street, High Times in Ladbroke Grove, 1967 to 1975. So do get yourself a copy. And uh, thank you again, David. Yeah, thanks very much, Jason. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the Strange Brew podcast. If you do like the show, please consider a small donation to help keep the show archive online. It's 10 years since I started the podcast and hosting fees are increasing over time. All your support keeps the show running and helps me get amazing guests. To support me, just go to thestrangebrew.co.uk where you'll see a donate button on the homepage. Thank you very much. Plus, any reviews on your podcast services help to spread the word too. Thank you.